My name is Dave Mosier. I work for Test Double, uh, which is a consultancy based out of Columbus, Ohio. But we, everyone at the company works remotely. And predominantly, uh, we work a lot with front-end tooling and frameworks. Um, we do general software consulting on whatever projects, clients, and tech stacks people have. But uh, a lot of what my last three years has been focused on is in the front-end space. Uh, so first with JavaScript, uh, with a lot of Backbone, and then Angular, and then Ember, kind of covering all the, the bases. And then about three years ago, I moved to CoffeeScript. And the, the point of this talk, um, the title could probably use some improvement. It's not necessarily building a full domain-specific language. Um, it's tips and tricks to take attributes of building a domain-specific language um, and sort of pulling that into the context of web development and why this is useful for web developers. So let's start with uh, just some theory and practical examples. We'll look at what a domain-specific language is, sort of the formal definition. Um, and then, like I said before, as a web developer, how many people are web developers here? Yeah, pretty much everyone. I figured the, the title with JavaScript and CoffeeScript would mostly only interest people interested in web development. But yeah, as a web developer, why should we care about this information? And then my goal is to give you practical examples and things you can walk away with. Um, the format of the talk is there's some slides, and then there's some coding examples. And we're going to go live code through in JavaScript and CoffeeScript um, in an implementation of one factor of a DSL. Uh, and then there's some other examples that I won't live code, but that I'll walk through um, specific to Angular and uh, just sort of generally structuring JavaScript applications. So a lot of the materials for this talk I pulled from um, a book by Martin Fowler on domain-specific languages. He kind of wrote uh, the de facto definition of this stuff. Um, has anyone read Fowler's book on domain-specific languages? Uh, it's a giant book with lots of heavy terminology. Um, so what I did was I actually went and pulled an introductory post uh, that he has on his blog um, that I'll have links for you after you can go check it out. Uh, and it's focused on something called a fluent interface, which we're going to take a look at a little bit later. But for the purposes of starting out, this is the formal definition of a domain-specific <laughs> language, which is a small language focused around a specific aspect of a so software system. And there's some characteristics about it that are pertinent to, to discuss. Uh, the main one being you don't usually build a whole program with a DSL. You have maybe one or more DSLs within your program that you use to compose little bits and pieces. And then the other uh, framing that Fowler does in, in his post um, and in the book is that there's two types of DSLs. There's an external one and an internal one. So for the purposes um, of external DSLs, uh, the, the formal definition, I'm sort of paring it down to the relevant bits, the language that's parsed independently of the host general purpose language. So that's sort of like a hand wavy, uh, quotey thing. But the, the example that we can use in the context of a web browser is CSS. CSS is a language that's parsed independently of the language of the browser, so HTML and JavaScript. CSS has its own parsing engine. This is the language of CSS um, as displayed in, I think it's called. ENF, which is Bacchus Nower form. Um, and this rule set is passed to a parser generator in the browser that actually consumes this and builds up uh, a language so that it can parse the CSS rules. All of these pieces are that. So that is an example of an external domain specific language. Um, so getting to the other form, an internal, uh, a form of API in a host general purpose language. So in the context of the browser, um, we're going to be looking at something called a fluent interface. And this is some procedural code, um, taking that example of uh, uh, an internal domain-specific language. This is um, in Flowers ex or Fowler's example, pardon me, uh, on fluent interfaces. This is some procedural code that you might see. And his original example was in Java, and I've converted it to JavaScript because that's what we're going to be working through in this example. Um, but if you look at this example, there's a few domain objects. There's orders and products. The code is pretty straightforward to follow if you follow it sort of top to bottom linearly. Uh, we're creating an order. We're creating a customer. Um, adding an order to that customer. We're adding some line items to uh, the order. And then uh, we're setting it to be skippable and setting rush. So there's some domain business logic concepts in here. Uh, and if we look at what we're going to do is take this and actually refactor it into a fluent interface. And sort of the most common um, domain-specific language construct that you'll see in internal implementations, sort of the stuff that you're going to be writing within the, the code that you're using, um, is a fluent interface. And so this code is sort of refactoring that procedural code into a, a fluent interface. And it's something 
that basically captures all of the business domain concepts. So the keywords that you see here, uh, we added a new order method onto the customer. We added a with, um, which the naming of is probably suspect, but with a line item, one widget, two pants, three cows. Um, that second one, uh, the with two pants, that's skippable. So we added a, a business logic piece to that. And these are just all methods, and they all chain. So that's sort of the definition of a fluent interface. Um, chain ability is not the, the definition by itself. Uh, it has to do with the fact that the business domain concepts in, the, in this case, um, all of the language constructs, the semantics of what we're reading, have to have to do directly with the business domain, the business logic. With line items, they're skippable. I can set a priority rush on this order. And they're very tightly integrated with the, the business logic. So that sort of sets up the, the definition of a fluent interface. Let's look at in the context of the browser, because that's what we're interested in. We're not necessarily interested in sort of the the um, academic look at, at fluent interfaces. We want context as web developers. And so one, one thing I think uh, people come to web development with is uh, a question of the value of doing something like this. Uh, if you were in Corey House's talk earlier on architecture, uh, is it valuable um, to spend time up front to think about uh, domain-specific language as an abstraction? Uh, there's a cost to complexity. And I like this quote um, by Merrick Squires. He says, I used to say I can bend space and time with two string and eval, and I've come to realize that it's generally better not to bend space and time in JavaScript. Uh, and I found that entertaining, but it, it sort of gets to the heart of this question of value. And so I think one thing to keep in mind as we're going to go through the live coding is um, I'm not presenting this to you as a way that you can go and then be like, I'm going to DSL everything. I'm going to make everything that I do into a DSL. Um, I really want to get forward the point that there needs to be a question of value, evaluating the complexity of this approach, and we'll sort of talk about that a little bit later when we get into the live coding. So in the browser, when we're talking about uh, candidates for writing a domain-specific language or pieces of your application in a way that sort of takes those attributes of a domain-specific language, the first thing we need to do um, to ask in any language is, does that language support metaprogramming? Because you need to be able to do metaprogramming uh, to be able to create a DSL. Any Ruby programmers? One Ruby, two Ruby programmers? Yeah. So the, the best way I can sort of draw parallels to this is metaprogramming is sort of inherent to the nature of Ruby due to a number of language constructs. Um, and evaluating JavaScript against Ruby's sort of to compare, we can look at a few things. Ruby has the ability to define methods or do dynamic dispatch. Um, JavaScript, you can do that just with assignment. Um, Ruby has method missing, uh, sort of dynamic uh, evaluation at runtime. JavaScript didn't support this until proxies came out in ES6. Um, and there's going to be the capability to do that in, in proxies. And both languages support eval, so basically creating a fragment of the language, passing it into an eval function, and then having, having it uh, parse and evaluate that. Um, the stars on assignment there, uh, the only caveat to um, sort of the analog of defined method in Ruby and JavaScript is we need to wait for object.define property to happen, and that's coming in, in ES6. So the, all that to say, JavaScript does have good metaprogramming support, so it is a candidate for writing a domain-specific language. So that's all of the academic stuff. So what's a realistic approach to building a domain-specific language in JavaScript? And I think um, if you stick to the strict definition in Fowler's book and in the article, um, he's very focused on that thing that I mentioned before, where the business domain concepts need to be represented very clearly in your code. And I think that uh, we don't always get to that point in the browser because a lot of the business logic doesn't live in the client. Even if you're building a rich client application, usually most of the rich client applications don't put all their business logic in the front end. It's presentational. So if you're using Angular or Backbone or Knockout or whatever, um, you're rendering templates, uh, you're making queries, but all of the logic that, that maps to the business domain logic lives in the server side. And so this is why I framed this slide as we need to focus on the benefits that we get from writing um, DSLs and not necessarily that strict definition of mapping to, to business logic. And the main benefits that you get are pretty similar to just generally creating abstractions in your code. Uh, we reduce the cognitive load. 
when we create an abstraction, um, we're limiting the surface area of the concepts that we have to map in our mind when we read that code. So ideally, that creates less stress for developers. We don't have to parse as much in our head when we're reading the code. Um, it helps to improve understanding in the concept, uh, the context of a domain-specific language. We're trying to improve understanding around the code reflects very clearly what the business goals are here. Uh, and then revealing intent. Ideally, writing code in this way should help people that come after us to, to understand what our intent was with the code. So those are the benefits that we're going to focus on. We're going to cover five areas uh, in this talk. Um, we're going to talk about um, these as sort of focus areas of extensions to those benefits. So the first is the idea of convention over configuration, sort of as popularized by Ruby on Rails, and now we're seeing that um, ideal or that, that benefit um, play, it, play out in a number of other uh, frameworks and languages. Meaningful semantics, the idea that what we write should have meaning, uh, and sort of a, a sub-point on optimizing for readability instead of writing. Uh, I think we read a lot more code as developers than we write, so we should really focus on do the semantics in our code map to um, things that are easy to understand uh, and relate to the business logic that we're writing. Fluent interfaces, we looked at that one example. We're going to do the live coding of that just shortly. Um, extensions to libraries, uh, kind of going to the solid principles, the open-closed principles. Um, if we're working with libraries and frameworks, uh, they should be open to extension and close to modification. So looking at how we can do that in the browser with some of the front-end frameworks and tools that we're using. And then I mentioned it before, but just the general concept of abstractions in the browser and with JavaScript and CoffeeScript and what that looks like. So let's start with a real simple example in convention over configuration. Um, when you're writing apps in the browser, you've probably gotten to a point where uh, you recognize that there's a global scope within the browser. Uh, there's the window object. Um, maybe your first cut at structuring an app goes through something like this, where you, uh, you have an app object, you stick it on the global scope, and uh, you've got sort of these namespaces. They're just really properties of an object that you're going to stick things. So this is a common pattern that I saw when we started out writing back backbone applications before ES6 modules had sort of been established and even before um, things like the asynchronous module definition AMD um, or common JS became common. It's just some place to stick my code to organize it. Um, and so the convention here is I've got a global in the very top level app. Uh, I've got views. Um, immediately the convention is that if I'm adding anything to views, they should live in app.views. Um, the interesting thing is that this pattern creates a bit of a problem that you can kind of see at the bottom there um, where I've got the comment with my view.js. So within any given file, if my architecture structure is that namespace on the global, um, then I need to sort of code defensively because I don't necessarily know the order of these files being included, right? This is some, some of the problem that um, using a module system like require.js or AMD solves or attempts to solve. Uh, but I've got this defensive code at the bottom where uh, I don't know if app's been defined because um, the, for all intents and purposes, the structure of a JavaScript application is the sum of its concatenated sources, right? And in the order that those get squished down and minified together. Um, so I need to verify that uh, if, if app hasn't been defined, if that top level thing hasn't been defined, then I'm just going to create an empty namespace there um, so that I don't really have to worry too much about the, the order of my files being included. Um, and then similarly, if app.views hasn't been defined, then I'm going to defensively code against that so that I don't get a runtime error when the browser goes to parse this and says, well, you can't talk to app.views and assign my view because app hasn't been defined and neither is app.views. This will raise an undefined error in the browser. And so the convention that we can wrap around this um, is actually a little library that we wrote called extend.js. And all it allows you to do is give a string separated by a delimiter, in this case the, the period, and um, it will automatically create those if they don't exist. And if they do exist, it'll just assign whatever you're sticking onto there. So this convention, and just creating this tiny little, um, it's not even a DSL, but it has sort of the attributes of a DSL. If you think of DSL mapping to business concepts, this is a DSL for developers. We have some um, semantics here, the, name, the, the, the function extend, and we're going to uh, create a namespace, but we don't really care how that all happens. Um, so I'll pull up an example of this and show you what it looks like. And this code will all be available on GitHub. I'm going to use a little node module called serve to just run a web server in this directory. So here's the code on GitHub if you want to grab it after, but you'll be able to grab this from um, the links at the end of the slide as well. 
So if I go to locals 3000 and we go to examples and extend. So you can grab extend here. Uh, this is written by a coworker of mine, Justin Searles. So sort of live coding that example, if I have an empty context in the browser, um, let me open the web page so I can show you exactly what we've included here. So this might be common for just prototyping, right? I've got uh, a vendor library, I've got underscore JS, um, I've got my extend library, and then this one which we'll talk about a little bit about later. But if I just wanted to like create app.views.myView, um, that's when I get that reference error, app isn't defined, right? So that's when I have to do app equals that, and then app.views equals that, and then uh, now I should be able to run that statement again. There we go. Um, so if I reload the page, and instead of doing all that, uh, we just use extend, then I can say app.views.myView, and maybe it's a function, maybe it's a backbone.view.extend, whatever, whatever you want to hang off here, it doesn't really matter. It's just a place to hang things. So I can do that, and now if I look at app, I can see that all that got kind of scaled out for me. So this is sort of useful to set up as a convention. So now uh, I don't have to defensively code in my application. Um, the DSL nature is, again, this is focused on uh, sort of the business logic for developers of where can I architect my app and hang things in the browser. Um, this approach falls down when you get into an app of any significant size or complexity. The only point is to show you that uh, domain-specific concepts don't have to necessarily map to business logic. They can map to concepts that developers are going to use to structure their applications. So that's all I wanted to show you there. So the next uh, benefit that I wanted to, to highlight, the first one was con convention over configuration, creating that convention where now developers know that if they use extend and they pass a string separated by periods, that's where they can, the, the convention of how to store things where um, works. And the next thing we get to is meaningful semantics. Just taking a really simple example, um, window.alert is probably one of the most horribly named functions in the browser. Um, because it has multiple meanings. And so when I'm talking about meaningful semantics, ideally when you're crafting abstractions or writing your code, one of the benefits of a DSL is that it eliminates multiple interpretations, ideally. Uh, so if I was thinking about window.alert, that could be an adjective, a noun, a verb. Um, it could be an idiom, like we alerted uh, the user, um, the guards were on high alert at the maximum security prison. There's multiple meanings there. So if we wanted to just take a pass through our code with the, uh, the thought of how do we improve it from a meaningful semantics point of view, we could rename this, right? We could say, really, we want to notify the act of notifying a user. So we could just alias it and say window.notify equals window.alert. This gets to a little bit um, more meaningful semantic, and there's less uh, chance that it's going to be misinterpreted. So keeping this in mind as we're crafting domain-specific languages. Getting Further to the point of meaningful semantics, one thing we ran into with this scheme where we created our developer-focused DSL using the extend library, what if you have another library that you're using that also mixes the semantics of that word? In this case, um, using CoffeeScript's class abstraction. So this is an example where I've got app.views.home and it's a backbone view in an app but I want to set up an inheritance structure with CoffeeScript. You can do this with the class keyword in CoffeeScript. And so what we found was when we started implementing this, developers would read this and become confused. What does extend singular mean versus extends plural? And so with keeping um, meaningful semantics in mind, we want to reduce the chance that somebody's going to um, not understand this well or misinterpret it. Um, and we want to avoid overloading the semantics here. So in this case, extend and extends are different but they're close enough uh, semantically that, that they might cause confusion. So what we ended up doing uh, was doing this sort of alias thing, like I mentioned before. Instead of alert, we're actually aliasing our own library to give better meaning and better semantics. Um, if you've coded in Ruby or Python, uh, which we were actually using Ruby on the server side for this project, then def is probably a common keyword, right? You use it to set up a method definition. In Python, you can set up a module definition or a class. Uh, and so we you know, maybe this is being overly intelligent, but we found that it improved the semantics when we said, okay, let's call our extend library that has the purpose of setting up a namespace, let's call it def, um, because it maps to a concept that we understand, given that we're working with Ruby on the back end, um, and Ruby developers understand this. 
So we said, okay, def is now the thing that hangs uh, whatever we're putting off of that namespace in the browser. So def app.views.home and now extends, uh, has much more meaning in the context of where it's being used to set up an inheritance chain, prototypal inheritance. We'll take a look at that a little bit later, how CoffeeScript does that. This, you know, helped us improve the semantics uh, of our code within the, co within the scope of developers reading this, which, again, I mentioned is important to optimize for readability as we read so much more code than we write, especially if you're working in a legacy system. So Fluent Interfaces, we looked at that procedural code before, um, and we're going to refactor that into a Fluent Interface, but I wanted first to take a look at uh, some examples of Fluent Interfaces that are currently out there. Um, this is one uh, domain-specific language for test assertions. Uh, anyone using Mocha to test their, their JavaScript? Any other testing frameworks like Jasmine or yeah, a couple, a couple Jasmine users? Um, so Mocha is split into two libraries. You can use Mocha, which is the test runner, uh, and you can use something called Chai, which is an assertion library. Um, and Chai gives you these really verbose assertions like you see here. So 5.should.b.exactly5 and dot b dot a number like that's pretty verbose and pretty expressive but it's also very explicit there's not a lot of room for um, error for somebody reading this right it's very clear and so the domain um, specific aspect of this is all of the keywords in this map pretty directly to asserting within the context of running a test um, so i would say that uh, this is a pretty decent example of a fluent interface um, sometimes this is easily confused confused just with method chaining, which is not fluency. Um, Fowler's definition of fluency is very uh, clear to point out that it has to map those semantics of the pieces in the domain-specific code back to business logic. So when you look at a, a library like underscore or even jQuery, which you might have used in the past, method chaining does not equate to, to fluency is the only point that I want to make here. Uh, the top version is underscore which actually requires an explicit chain call if you want to set up a chain of events in a, in a sort of functional um, approach. Lodash doesn't require it. That's, that's sort of tertiary to the point here. All I'm saying is method chaining doesn't equal fluency. So let's get back to our procedural code, just to refresh before we dive into live coding. Um, so we've got this make normal function. This is what Fowler had set up again in Java. I refactored it to JavaScript. Uh, we're creating an order, adding an order to a specific customer. Uh, we've got some line items with products, uh, with a product ID. Um, there's a query that's happening with product.find. We're not going to worry too much about the implementation of that for refactoring it into JavaScript, or to the Fluent interface, sorry. Uh, we need to set skippable. The, the ability to set a, a line item as skippable, and then we need to, to the, the ability to set an order as priority rush. So those are our domain concepts. And here's our Fluent interface that Fowler actually provided, but he didn't give the implementation on how to implement this. Um, so this is the part that we're going to walk through. And hopefully, just keep in mind as we do this, um, the first way that I'm going to do this is not the right way, and there is no right way. The goal here is to get you to think about things like, is the complexity of this approach worth it? Um, Am I going to confuse people on my team by writing code this way? Uh, maybe the, the narrowing of scope and the, the revealing of intent and the clarity that comes with this is a good approach. Those are the sorts of things that I want you to think about as we're going to walk through this. All right. So I'm going to open a test first. And this is our first look at CoffeeScript. This um, test is using. Uh, something called Jasmine for running the tests. So if you're using Jasmine, you're probably familiar with describes and uh, you've probably seen you know, before eaches and its. Um, the, the general structure of Jasmine as a, as a test runner is set up in, in, a, in a style called BDD, which is business driven development. And the goal, if you haven't used it before, is whereas um, sort of traditional test frameworks were uh, oriented towards developers, things using like assert keywords. Um, BDD is intended to map business concepts into tests. And the idea was that uh, business people or business analysts would be able to write tests in BDD style. Um, so I'm using uh, Jasmine. I'm using CoffeeScript. Uh, if we want to see, if, if you're, anyone using CoffeeScript? A couple people. Anyone just have no idea about CoffeeScript? Never, never used it before? few people. Um, here's the really quick rundown of CoffeeScript. Um, you don't need parens. They're optional in CoffeeScript. 
Uh, so it, it looks very much like Ruby in that regard, or Python. Um, it's white space aware, so it's indentation aware. You can see that I also don't have any control, control braces like this. Semicolons you also don't need. The arrow maps directly to the function keyword. So if I actually select this line and just compile the JavaScript and put those side by side. So this is the JavaScript and that's the CoffeeScript. So not a lot of differences there. Um, the only other one you're going to notice here is the at character. So let's compile that one. App just references this. Um, the other library that I'm using here, just we're not going to dive into it too much, is called Jasmine Given, which is taken from uh, a library called RSpec Given, and it basically allows you to replace your it and um, expect keywords with given when and then. So we're going to express our tests in terms of given when and then. So let's look at the test for uh, this code that we want to write. So given we have a subject, which is a customer, um, we want some method called new order on that customer. And this is sort of our sanity test to say, when we create an order, it should have an ID of one. And, and we're going to need some way internally to capture the line items, right? If we look back at that, uh, at that example here, um, with is mapping to a list of line items. So we need some way to capture that. Uh, let's describe the chaining or the fluent interface. So I'm just taking that example here and, and putting it here and saying, when I say that I have an order with one widget, with two pants, that is skippable, uh, with three cows, that is priority rush, uh, then these are all my assertions, basically. So Jasmine Given uh, and CoffeeScript are used to sort of just reduce the amount of noise in your tests. Um, this is totally a side point, but just something that uh, I think is valuable. Uh, our test should be readable, as readable, if not more readable than our code. Um, so given all that, uh, I'm going to run the tests. We're going to fail. And I'm using grunt to set up the test runs. So let's see what our first failure is. So at the very top of the file, I was trying to record, uh, require order domain objects. And uh, that's actually because my other test is failing. So let me just X that out. In Jasmine um, and Jasmine given, you can just put an X in front of the tests or a suite if you don't want to, uh, to have it run. So that'll get that one out. And then we should have one test run. Uh, it's still running that one. Just comment it out. There we go. Now we're working in JavaScript. The first implementation we're going to do in JavaScript, the second one where we make some improvements to um, the Fluent interface, we'll do in CoffeeScript. All right, so closing that for now. The first thing that I can solve is I'm trying to require in a, a lib of fluent.js, and I don't actually have a lib folder. So let's fix that and add our folder. And we'll create in the lib folder uh, fluent.js. We'll run the tests again. We'll get a different error. So now at least we have a valid um, error down at an assertion level. Uh, so we're saying undefined is not a function. Uh, and this is where we can start implementing our actual interface. So the first thing I like to do is pull up the test code as I'm doing this. And if you guys have questions, just feel free to stop me and ask about anything. Um, so here's right, really what we care about, uh, this slice here. So we need a few domain objects. We need um, customers, we need orders, we need line items. So let's stub those out really quick. So let's say domain object equals function. And I need three of them. That's a customer, a line item, and an order. So the order is going to have width, um, but the order is going to need to know about tracking its number of line items. So if we want this fluent interface to be supported, we need to think in terms of um, value objects. So something that's going to store just like the the pieces of information that are related to this, to each of these domain objects. Um, and then we need the domain-specific concepts. So for the first implementation, we're going to mix the domain-specific pieces, so those functions like with skippable and priority rush, with the value objects. Because it's honestly one of the easiest ways that you, you can get to this ability to support a method, in, uh, a fluent interface and method chaining. So with the customer, 
and I use my cheat sheet here. We need orders, so let's create an array. And a line item, I'm trying to remember what it tracks. Yeah, let's do, if we jump back to our test, I think actually the first thing I called and the undefined error is actually gonna be new order. Um, so, so we need to add that on customer, so let's do that. And uh, let's create a new order with an ID of one. Um, and then all we're gonna do is push that order onto uh, the stack or the array and then return that order. Um, and the pattern that you'll notice when trying to set up a Fluent interface is that you have to always return either the object in question or return this to support the method chaining. So if we do that and run the tests, we should get a different failure. Still undefined is not a function, cannot call method new order. Uh, this is because um, I've required it, but haven't actually exported it. And we're using CommonJS modules here, so I actually need to export some stuff. So there's a bit of boilerplate that I'm gonna chuck in just down at the bottom here. So within CommonJS, the way that you expose something is with module.exports, and it can be a function, it can be an object, or it can be, in this case, I'm going to expose like a bag of objects. So let's say customer, customer, order, order, and line item, line item. So now, if we run the test, there we go. So now we we expected that we should have an order ID of one, and we got undefined equals one, so that's one failure. And then down further on the assertions, we started looking at line items, but we haven't implemented any of that stuff. So let's go do that. Let's look at line item next and go back to our sort of desired fluent interface here. So with should work on a line item, um, and it should create, uh, this could either be a quantity or an ID for the line item. It's not really clear based on Fowler's example. So I think I just assumed that it was an ID, yeah. So let's do order next, because the order, the, the place that all of these sort of functions are gonna exist is on the order. We're gonna use that as sort of the, um, the aggregator of all the domain knowledge for these things. So let's do order. So we need some properties, um, because this function in JavaScript is a constructor function, and the reason that we know that uh, is because we used the new keyword up here, and we're also using the new keyword here when we're creating an order. So JavaScript functions can either be methods uh, or they can be constructors, which is one of the more confusing things about JavaScript, which is solved uh, in ES6 with the ad addition of an explicit constructor. So within an order, we need to track line items. And then uh, that priority flag, so let's set it to false, because by default, we don't want all, our, all our orders in our system to be priority. And let's map out each of those domain concepts. So those are going to be methods. So let's say with. And let's duplicate that three times. And this is going to be skippable. And this will be priority rush. And so the first thing that we're going to do is we're just going to set the last, the return value uh, to return this. So this is basically when you're building a fluent interface in JavaScript, this is all you need to keep in mind. Actually, in any language, right, you need to return the instance of the thing. So I'm going to return this. Um, so with is going to take two arguments. We're going to have a line item ID and a product. Um, let's call it. Yeah, we'll stick with product. It could be the product name because it's not actually a product instance, uh, but I'll stick with product for now. Similarly to how we were keeping track of orders here, having a new order function, creating an order, pushing it on, and returning that, we're going to do the same thing uh, with with. We're going to create a line item, passing along the ID and the product, uh, and a reference to the order. Uh, then we're going to say that place that we're keeping track of them, we want to push that thing. Uh, and then the last step is to return this. Let's do skippable. So let's do priority rush next. So priority rush doesn't actually take anything, but it's going to flip that um, priority attribute that we had set defaulted to false. It's going to just flip it to true. So that one's a pretty easy one. 
and skippable. This this is the one where uh, it's arguably got the most knowledge because it has to have some knowledge of state. If we look at skippable here, we have to know what the previous line item was in order to set it uh, skippable. And then we also need to return an order object because that's where all of these methods exist. So it's got some sort of temporal state it needs to operate on this previous segment. Um, but then still be chainable to support the next dot width, which is going to exist on the order, but operate on the line item. So there's a couple ways that we could do this. I think the easiest way uh, is given that it's always usually going to be, or it's always going to be executed on the most recently added line item. We can just access that line items array, go back one on the on the stack, uh, and use the length property. So we can say this line items length, this line items length minus one. So that gets us the previous line item. Uh, we can check set should skip equals true. And that should skip property is going to live on our line item object. So we can default it here to false in line item. And the line item constructor, I think it's pretty straightforward. Yeah, it's just basically a value object. It takes an ID, um, an order, and then that product reference. I don't even need that actually. I think I'm not even using that order reference. So let's whack it. And where did I add that? Right there. So we don't need that. Any questions about this so far? Clear as mud? <laughs> um, hopefully, this should get our test to pass. If not, Maybe I got another ID is not defined. Uh, let me see. Right. I didn't pass it in there. There we go. So now our Fluent interface works. Let's open it up in the browser and just sort of verify so that I'm not just like smoking mirrors hand waving the. Uh, the test runner example. Let's see it work in the browser. So if I go here, let me grab this. So we can create a new customer. And now I should have customer. And it's got those default values. So it's got that new order function. Now I should be able to execute all of this in sequence and sort of inspect the, the value object that I get back after. There we go. So I got an order, uh, its line items were populated, and I can look at those, and there's line item instances in there. And should skip is false, but the second line item, should skip is true. One of the interesting pieces is that I mentioned before is right now we have domain objects, so we have customer and line item in order, um, but the most of them are value objects, right? Like uh, the customer is a value object. It has that sort of factory method to create a new order that we're creating just to satisfy the test. Um, line item is a pure value object, right? It just has uh, value properties that are either passed through the constructor or a default value. Um, but manipulating that should skip, uh, there's no there's no getter or setter, uh, so there's like an encapsulation issue there. Uh, the other thing is, the, the more important point is, order contains, it is both a value object and it is the source of our domain specific language, the Fluent interface, which is, it violates the single responsibility principle, right? An object should have one and only one responsibility. Uh, so I'll go jump into CoffeeScript next and we'll take a look at how we can improve this to separate out value objects from constructing the domain by creating a separate builder object. If anyone heard of the builder pattern before? Yeah, so the builder pattern uh, kind of really works well when you're creating a domain specific language or a fluent interface. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Uh, right, and this is where I commented out my other test. So let's close that guy. Oh, I know it was failing, because even though I X'd this out, it was failing on the require. It was still executing that. So in this case, uh, previously, we only had that, that one exports from, uh, let me just open it up again. Yeah, here we go. We only had our libfluent.js, which married both the value objects and the domain objects. 
Um, let's take a look at splitting that out into two separate pieces, being explicit about the domain objects and then having that builder pattern. So what it looks like in the test is uh, I've got an order, which is I'm going to have these domain objects as my local variable. It's going to export a bunch, of, a bunch of those things, basically the customer, the order, and the line item. So I'm going to create that separately, and then I'm going to have all of the domain concepts encapsulated in this fluent order builder that I pass an instance of order to and it's going to be responsible for um, setting up the, the fluency on that object. So that the, the uh, describing the chaining works the same, um, the only difference is in the implementation. So let's take a look at how that works. So the first thing we need to create is order domain objects uh, and actually I'm going to go back here and comment that one out. So now I should have a test failure. Yeah, there we go. Right, so we can't get order domain objects, so let's create that one first. Uh, order domain objects, and we're doing it in CoffeeScript. Okay. Uh, and if I remember correctly, if we jump back to libfluent, um, just to sort of contrast the differences between CoffeeScript and JavaScript, and one of the reasons that I like CoffeeScript, um, again, talking about JavaScript functions as having multiple purposes. They can be methods on an object, or they can act as a constructor, and the, um, the ambiguity of that, because unless you have the new keyword, then it's not going to act as a constructor, but it could still act as a constructor if you did like a factory pattern. So instead of using new, if I like got rid of that, and then I just had um, order function, the last thing it does is return an object that mapped all these properties, right? That's sort of the factory pattern in JavaScript. Um, so it's kind of malleable, but it's, it's non-specific. Uh, let me just undo that. So what I like about CoffeeScript is you get the class keyword, and you're going to get this in ES6 anyway, um, but I've been using CoffeeScript for like three years, and so kind of reaping all the benefits of um, being more explicit about creating objects uh, and the ability to set up prototypal inheritance chains. So I can say class customer and order and line item. And just those lines, uh, let's take customer for example, and if I compile that, so it actually created a closure for me, uh, a local variable that's going to be, it'll be placed on the scope wherever this is executed. Um, and then it created an internal function and then returned that. So that's not very useful on its own, uh, but with CoffeeScript we can say uh, we can add an explicit constructor, and let's set up our exports so that that test fails. Um, we had to do that boilerplate down here. I like the, the terseness of CoffeeScript. This becomes a lot simpler. So like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines becomes one line. We get the conditional operator so that we don't have to say if type of module equals undefined and module equals null. Um, we can say assign it to exports. And then this is a shortcut that's really nice. If the key and the value in an object literal match um, the same string in CoffeeScript, you can just do that shortcut and it'll just do that for you. So one of the, the nicer pieces about CoffeeScript. Um, all right, so we've got our constructor. Let's jump back up here. Uh, we need this dot order, so again, at orders equals that. Um, sorry, orders. We need our constructor. Um, another shortcut in CoffeeScript is if you're just doing this kind of line here, where you're passing in a constructor arg and then assigning it right away, you can do that in CoffeeScript just by saying at id. So if I compile this, you can see it, it did that for me. So another nice little shortcut, if you're using CoffeeScript and didn't know that, you can do that. Uh, and then the other pieces we just need as default values. So line items, and that priority equals false, right there. Let's do the order one. Oh, sorry, I think I did them in the wrong order here. I think it goes up there. And we need here for line item at ID and at product we're getting assigned, and then a default value of should skip. So that's all we need for the domain objects. Um, the thing I like about this, and what we'll see when we do the builder pattern, is it simplifies it, right? We're only working with uh, pure value objects in our, in our domain. 
Um, very simple, uh, nothing crazy. Gives us a little bit more flexibility if we need to change properties of the value objects. They don't have to know anything about uh, the order builder that we're going to create. And CoffeeScript is just a little bit more terse. I mean, even if we took out these functions, we're looking at like 30 lines versus 15, so like a reduction of, of half in the noise. This isn't an advertisement for CoffeeScript, by the way. I'm just mostly interested in exploring the how you how you create the Fluent interface. Um, but I do like CoffeeScript. So let's add lib and what was it? Let me split by two. Order builder. On Fluent order builder. So the first thing we need is access to those domain objects. Uh, so let's require that in. Um, and let's create local references to order and line item. Uh, order. Uh, let's use our class keyword again. So we're going to create that if we jump back to the test and put it at the bottom. Uh, what is it called? Fluent Order Builder. And it's got a constructor and it takes in an instance of an order. Uh, and I'm actually going to ignore that for now. I guess I could just do this. Um, yeah, and that will just basically, if I compile that, just to verify, that's going to just assign the order that we passed in down here on line 6. So that's all we need for sort of what, what value objects we're going to pass in to kick it off. And then we need all those domain concepts in our fluid interface. So we need with uh, priority rush skippable. And again, uh, if I just go here. All of those are going to return this as the last thing to support chaining. Uh, the arguments are going to be the same. So width is going to take a line item ID and a product. Um, now instead of having a reference directly to uh, those orders, we're just going to say, hey, order, you have you know about your line items, so we're just going to call into that. Um, and the, the Fluent Order Builder knows how to map the domain concepts to setting up the value objects to be in the state that we want. And then priority rush becomes order. You need to set priority rush. I'm not using setter or getter, just for sort of um, brevity. And skippable, that same sort of thing. And then the last thing that we're doing, you can see down here in the test, is slightly different. We added one explicit function, so we need to tell the fluent um, order builder, when it's done, we just call a build. And this is sort of a, a familiar pattern that you'll see in the builder pattern as one sort of final statement um, that's not really related to the domain, but it's related to we need to get this thing out. We know that we're done with it. So it's at the build function. And all we're going to do is return the order, because at that point, that's all we need. Uh, and then we just need to set up that exports chain because we're requiring it in the test. So we can do our little trick again. Uh, the reason I'm doing the conditional there is because I want this to work in the browser, and the browser doesn't have a global called module. Um, this this is working within Node and the require system for the test runner, but I want to be able to execute in the browser as well. So that's that's the reason for the conditional operator there. So let's see if that works. Uh oh, and I think did I forget? Did I name something? Oh yeah, priority instead of priority rush. So like, you know, I've got the name of the function and it doesn't even map directly to the property. So there's a bit of confusion and mismatch there. Maybe that's an area that could be improved. There we go. We've got two files that are smaller than the one that we had. Uh, and I think as a general order um, or a general directive, uh, 
having many small files is always better than having one large file in a project. And I think as developers, we usually optimize for massive files with God objects in them instead of many small files. So I like the fact that we've got two, two files. I like that the responsibilities are separated. One is a value object store. One maps the domain concepts that we're using to create our Fluent interface. Any other thoughts? Cool. If you think of anything, tweet at me after, or go fork the code on GitHub. Um, it, it'll be available. So one thing we keyed in on was sort of the cost of implementation. And Fowler's quote here is interesting. The price of this fluency is more both more effort both in thinking and in the API construction itself. Coming up with a nice fluent API requires a good bit of thought. So if you're going to take this approach and say, I'm going to go create fluent interfaces for everything, or I'm going to create a DSL in my application, uh, it might be worth considering the cost up front. Um, and I think this is in line also with what Corey was saying in his architecture presentation. Right? You need to consider um, the drawbacks and the benefits and weigh that out. Uh, and I think the other thing is if you don't have people who are um, experienced with JavaScript on your project or CoffeeScript, then uh, creating the overhead of adding this builder pattern and the value objects and creating a fluent interface might be lost on people with less experience. So you have to temper that and tailor it to, to your team environment. The last two sections, the first one I want to co cover very briefly is extensions to libraries. So we did a couple applications in Backbone and uh, we set up, we looked at our, our way to store things with our little wrapper around extends using def, and we ended up using that. Um, but one piece that we found was backbone views. Anyone done backbone projects? A couple people. Backbone views all have a render method, right? And the render method, the only dependency is the element that I'm going to render, um, it needs to exist in memory or it needs to exist in the DOM, and that where I'm going to render it. Uh, the, the thing that we found with backbone apps was we constantly either would have to manage when that was there, like is the element actually in the DOM or is it just in memory? Um, and sometimes we wanted to wait until the parent element or the root of the thing was in and then call render on different pieces. So in this case, this is a view that um, might have had a parent view for like setting up an accordion view with jQuery or some other plugin. Uh, but we wanted to be able to create the semantics where I could say, any developer can add a render method with like a hook that guarantees that it will be rendered after the element exists in the DOM. And so Backbone Fix in Superview um, added some semantics to extend uh, Backbone views so that you could say render jQuery accordion or render whatever. And the concept mapped there, uh, the domain concept for developers was this is going to happen after the parent element comes um, or is in the DOM. And you can check out Backbone Fix since there if you're doing Backbone projects. It just gives you a really nice way to avoid having to like do detection in your render method. Um, and if you want to have multiple steps or things that happen after the parent element's rendered, um, it's a great way to do that. Generally applicable is the principle that we can add extensions to libraries to improve the semantics of the code that we're writing. Anyone doing Angular projects? One of the pieces that I added to Angular um, was using that concept of namespaces and adding a behavior or sort of convention over configuration there was the first piece was where I'm going to store it, so like app.views or app.controllers or things like that. And then the next was in Angular, you can actually, um, it will automatically try to fetch a template if you pass a template to one of its directives, if it doesn't exist inside of a template cache. Let me show you that in a little demo here. So this is, and if you haven't used Angular, this is not a very exhaustive intro, but the first thing you'll see is that when this page loaded, there was a an XHR that fired for um, examples, Angular AutoWire directive says hi.html. This is how Angular works. Let's take a look at the element here. So this is just an H1. Uh, and the only thing that happened was this H1 was actually the result of fetching that template. If we look here. So here's what the, the server returned for that template over the XHR, which is just a fragment of HTML. It'll probably help to look at the actual index page. So let me pull that up. So again, very simple. I've got my dependencies here. Um, and this is a directive. And if you haven't used Angular, this is kind of what Angular allows you to do, is create custom elements, attributes, classes, so that you can write your own HTML elements uh, and 
have behavior happen when the browser detects that, or when Angular detects that in the browser. So I've created a directive here that, that is called says hi. Um, the, the interesting thing is how I've defined that. So I'm including those dependencies I had before, underscore my little extend library so that I can hang things, Angular. Um, I've got my app module, which in Angular is just that. Um, I've got my directive, so let's take a look at that in JavaScript. So again, here's my def um, syntax. So we know that from before, doing this should guarantee that I have an app.directive.says hi on the window global. So if I take a look there. There we go. So that got me that. Um, the additional piece that we added was, given that def is a function that takes this as an argument, um, we can do interesting things with this. So for example, in Angular, I didn't define the template or the template URL, which would map to uh, that path that we saw in the browser, right? Directive slash says hi.html. Um, and so all this does, without diving too much into Angular, is when you detect an element that looks like says dash high, it trans transposes, Angular transposes camel case to the dash because you can't have camel case in an HTML element. Um, it would say, check for if there's an element here and then execute this linking function. That's all Angular does. Um, and it's going to bind the result of that message that I passed in in the HTML right here. This is from uh, Code Mash where I did this talk the first time. Uh, and it's going to replace it with whatever's in the template. So it's going to swap out these double curly. So that's what you can see rendering here. So again, the interesting piece is this set up that, that chain in the namespace. Um, but I didn't have to define this template URL. And the reason is I took the principle of if I've got a place to store this in the namespace, how can I sort of add a bit of convention over configuration to this? And so that's where this Angular auto wires thing comes into play. And I'm not going to dive into everything here. Um, the bottom piece is my def wrapper. And looking at that argument to def, so it's going to have this as the first argument and this is the second one, the piece that I'm pulling off is that namespace here. And I'm splitting it on dot. And I'm giving some meaning to these things. So this is really the module name. This is the object type, which you can see down here. Uh, and then this is the target name. And so using that, I've sort of added a little bit of extra sugar inside of my, my extend wrapper to say there's meaning in these pieces to that segment. So I'm going to do something intelligent, maybe too intelligent, you might argue. And I'm going to automatically detect uh, if it's a directive, then um, set it up so that it's a directive. Uh, and I'm going to assign a template URL using some convention. So I know that in this case, it's really easy, right? Like I can take... Um, that path where the template exists. I can convert the name of the directive um, from camel case to snake case. That's what this does. And then HTML. So the convention that I've set up is now developers don't have to think about where's this template. It's automatically going to get set up so that it, uh, it compiles it and injects it properly. And I don't have to add that boilerplate, right? A little bit of convention over configuration. Um, you might say the disadvantage of that is then that actually hides the fact that this object is being mutated at runtime with a template URL. All valid concerns and all things you can, should consider. The only point here is to show you that um, it's doable. And uh, when you're thinking about improving semantics, improving readability, readability focusing on convention over configuration, this is um, one way you can do that by building abstractions on top of your abstractions that you already have and leveraging that stuff. Abstractions was the last point. This is really short. I don't have a live code example, but um, Angular and the web component spec that's coming out, they're really designed to take um, all of the verbosity that exists right now. So for the, the example here is I've got a jQuery date picker or something like that in my markup. Would it be nice to encapsulate all of that noise into date picker, a custom element? So with web components, you'll be able to do that. You can do that now with Angular and Ember components. Um, and so the, the whole goal is to think of, uh, is there some way that I can take this and reduce, create an abstraction that's meaningful, reduce the cognitive overhead, all of those other benefits that we got from writing the Fluent DSL, can I do that in my, in my browser code? Another interesting one, um, the CSS selector paradigm that jQuery sort of invented, the ability to reverse select an element in the DOM with a CSS selector, uh, this didn't actually exist in the native 
DOM API. Um, and then the browser implementer saw that jQuery was doing this, um, say, hey, that's a really useful abstraction to be able to like use a CSS selector because web developers know CSS selectors and how to target an element for style, but can we reverse it and say from JavaScript, I want to use that CSS selector to get an element to do something with. That's basically what jQuery did. So when the browser vendor saw this, they took that, um, composed it into a meaningful abstraction, and that's where we got document.query selector all. So if you're not using jQuery and you didn't know, you can use document.query selector all and pass it a CSS selector and get an element. The whole point here is, again, taking something that developers were doing anyway and mapping it into a, an abstraction uh, at the root level. And if we think of that as a general principle for how we architect our code, um, look at what developers are doing. If, they're, if you think developers are being too intelligent, um, using like that uh, the Angular template loading example uh, as an example. If that's too intelligent, um, ask the question why. Like, is there an abstraction here that can be pulled out? Is there something meaningful here that, that we can pull out in our, in our front end code to um, leverage the value of that, but maybe reduce the complexity or reduce the duplication if it's happening all over the place? This is the end goal of that abstraction. And um, you can do this with Ember or uh, React or Angular. This is actually from a project that, I, that I'm working on right now where um, it's an enterprise project and they had a data table. And like every enterprise project I've ever worked on, they've had some sort of data table plugin. Like I've done ones with YUI data tables, jQuery data tables. Um, there's like ng-create if you're using Angular. And the whole goal was to allow the people the other developers in the organization, we were working with them as consultants, to, um, they didn't have a lot of JavaScript expertise. So we wanted to create a domain-specific language in HTML that allowed them to say, hey, I want a new grid screen, and I want these columns on it, and I want to have something like an inline editor that you can see there on line 31. Uh, but we didn't want them to have to write the JavaScript. And Angular is really good at this. I can show you the demo really quickly. All right, so here's the demo. And let me shrink that a little bit. So this is our DSL. This is actually what the markup looks like um, when the user or the developer implements it in HTML. But what gets rendered out, it looks nothing like that. I'll show you. It's basically just a table. Um, you can see my with inline editor came across. Um, and that adds some behavior. Uh, to each row. So that with inline editor adds a new column here, the edit column. When I click on that, I actually get a drop down thing, and this is two way bound to the value in there. So this is really the end goal of thinking about a domain specific language. Um, we can think about domain specific language in terms of mapping business concepts, which is sort of the strict definition, or we can think of it in terms of mapping. Um, developer concepts, so wanting to create a screen that's going to remote load data from this endpoint. That's just going to remote load this data.js file, and you can see that it actually makes a request for that when, when the page loads. Um, with these columns mapping, uh, this is the title that I want to appear up there, and this is the actual key in the data, um, but the developer implementing this or the user implementing this doesn't have to write JavaScript. They, does, they don't have to know about it. So is it a meaningful abstraction? I don't know. Would a user get value? I guess if they didn't want to write JavaScript, but they wanted to create screens where they were rendering a data table, it's a meaningful abstraction. Uh, the complexity, Angular has got a massive learning curve. I'm not even going to bother to try and jump into all of the code for this, but I just want to show you how much complexity there is to achieve this result. So this is what the data looks like for those products. Um, so all of that. This. All of that, um, those very few lines of dense sort of custom elements and attributes is encapsulated in like 100 lines of JavaScript with all of this Angular specific goop. Um, so there's a significant amount of complexity to get to this point. Uh, so the, the, the only point I want to make here is the cost benefit of this is what you need to consider if you're doing this. Um, is it easier just to like create an element with jQuery and call jQuery data tables or render some plugin? Probably. Uh, it really depends on what you're doing. Um, but you can 
think in terms of a domain-specific language and map those concepts into HTML or JavaScript with a fluent interface or things like that. Um, but there is added complexity. If you want to kind of take a look at how this was done, uh, I've actually got a screencast up on YouTube called Advanced Angular Directives that walks through this example from scratch. So if you're interested in that, I can show you guys after uh, a URL. So recapping, um, thinking about domain-specific languages not as uh, directly coupled to business logic, but thinking about the value that writing a domain-specific language provides. Convention over configuration, more meaningful semantics, um, fluent interfaces is sort of one example of that. Uh, the ability to add extensions to libraries and thinking of how to create abstractions in our code. And the values, right, that's the real thing that's driving this, is the values to keep in mind. Can we reduce cognitive load when our developers or when our, our fellow peers are reading this code? Uh, can we improve the understanding, optimizing for readability? Does our code reveal the intent? We can use developing in a, a domain-specific language um, focused on business logic or focused on sort of framework-y, developer-y, infrastructure-y uh, type stuff to reveal the intent. Um, but there's a cost to that, right? So we need to be pragmatic. We need to be aware of that complexity. Cost-averse, being cost-averse is an effective strategy as well. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, if you have feedback, please fill out the session survey. That's the only way that we get feedback from Darcy and are able to get invited back. So 